So welcome everyone. Uh, so neuroscience, brain science, and cognitive uh, cognitive science data uh, sources are really diverse, and so I'll begin with uh, just one uh, slide that comes from uh, Teresnaski et al., uh, who have written wonderful commentary in Nature earlier this year, uh, showing uh, the data set that's coming from uh, diverse space and time element here, coming from at the level of cells all the way out to the organ brain, and then different time points of uh, as little as uh, sub milliseconds all the way to the months and ends. We had multiple uh, great lectures yesterday, uh, including EM data set from uh, uh, earlier morning and uh, MEG data set and fMRI and so on. These heterogeneous brain data actually are even more compounded by utilizing a variety of different kinds of animal models, going from very small models to, to larger. Uh, and not to mention that we are really trying to incorporate between these kinds of experiment data set along with now uh, behavior. So from this session, we're hoping to actually um, discuss how could we integrate, integrate all these different kinds of data set in an open science, science platforms. We, this uh, session has been organized by Christoph Koch, who couldn't be here today. Uh, from Allen Institute and myself. And we begin um, with uh, Jeremy Freeman from HHMI, followed by Greg Faber from NIH, and then uh, finished by Josh uh, Vogelston from Johns Hopkins and Chan Hill from representing not only Human Brain Project, but also INCF. Begin with Jeremy. Okay, okay great. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for being here, and thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to do what is basically a lightning talk. This will be extremely fast. Uh, our goal is to have a lot of discussion here, and hopefully the other speakers will do the same. Uh, there is a lot of, hopefully, depth behind a lot of the things I'll say, and I, I wish I could uh, go into more detail into them, but please come talk to me afterwards to discuss any of these topics uh, in, in, in more detail. This, to me, is the problem we're trying to solve. This is the brain. Uh, to me, the brain is everything that takes place between uh, stimuli, stuff in the outside world that we experience, and the behaviors that we are capable of. Uh, the brain is responsible for all of that. And I believe in order to understand this system, uh, we need to be able to look at as much of it as possible. This is a sort of very schematized version of what a bunch of neurons and their connectivity looks like. Of course, as we've been hearing, there's a tremendous amount of richness. And I think all of that richness is important. Things like cell type diversity, heterogeneity, heterogeneity of computation. And we need to be working in systems where we can look at as much of that as possible. I did my PhD work in uh, the visual system of the primate, also working with fMRI in humans. Uh, now I'm working in much smaller critters that I think afford a much richer uh, for, uh, sort of forms of experimental investigation into neural coding, and that's all I'll be showing examples of. One such system that I think is particularly exciting, can we dim the lights? Yeah. Is that possible? <laughs> that like shut off the building. <laughs> Self-destruct button. <laughs> Is the world still working? <laughs> Did we just do something really bad? <laughs> <laughs> Great, that was exciting. Um, <laughs> so what we are what we are seeing in this video uh, that we now can see because of the lights um, is whole brain measurements of neural activity in a very special animal, the larval zebrafish. Uh, we can use whole brain or do whole brain recordings in the larval zebrafish because this animal is transparent. This is using a, a very recently developed technique or recently uh, sort of expanded technique called light sheet microscopy. What we're looking at in this movie is a maximum projection through depth. The color indicates changes in fluorescence. So we're using uh, calcium fluorescence as an indicator, a fairly uh, close uh, marker of neural activity. We're watching it evolve on a time scale of about one hertz. So these are not recordings at the time scale of say action potentials, but they're quite fast. Um, and we're looking at activity evolve across the brain. We can do these 
measurements, make these measurements of whole brain activity in the context of behavior. So this is, uh, or at least fictive behavior, this is an animal that is responding to a visual stimulus. Just to orient you, uh, these are the, where the zebrafish's eyes would be. This is the front of its brain, uh, and this is the back of its brain. It's sort of a foreign animal, probably, for many people here. Uh, and in this experiment, there is a visual stimulus up here that's moving on and off. Every 10 seconds, it starts moving. And in response to this stimulus, the animal is swimming and we're, we're intending to swim, and we're picking up on that in the form of an electrophysiological signal that indicates the strength of its swimming, and that's what the size of the circle is. So if you watch the movie, what you see is that every 10 seconds or so, the stimulus starts to move, the dot gets bigger because the animal is swimming, and there's this rich pattern of dynamic activity that evolves across the brain. <coughs> Quite possibly. Uh, so that's one, of, that's one of many things that one might try to, to analyze or, or sort of some of the structure or patterns that one might try to uncover in this kind of data. Um, you know, essentially what we're looking at, um, and then one can decompose it further, we are looking at the activity of at single cell resolution, every cell or nearly every cell in the brain, um, as well as structure from neuropil. In some cases, we see signal in axons and dendrites. So there's a huge amount of rich information that can be drawn both about perhaps the function as well as possibly things that at least like functional connectivity. Um, the challenge with working with this kind of data, which is really the challenge of working with data across the sort of data industry, um, which is really not exclusive to neuroscience, is that the raw data from these experiments is really big. That movie I was just showing you was the result of about one terabyte of data that comes from one experiment. And we do maybe one or two experiments every day. So the rate at which we're generating these data sets is pretty, uh, pretty significant. Um, the general pipeline or sort of idea for what to do with data like this is to take raw data and ideally extract out signals of interest, things that are sort of much smaller, reduced representations of the data, which we can then analyze and visualize and explore. Uh, as all of you, I think, are probably familiar with, this is a complicated process. It's especially cool and but complicated in the case of neuroscience data because our ways of thinking about how to do this are constantly evolving. There are very few sort of standard ways to analyze a neural data set. It's incredibly rich and heterogeneous, even for one type of data, let alone multiple types of data. And what this uh, mandates is that we have flexible platforms for working with very, very large data sets and exploring them interactively. So this is something that we've been developing um, in my group at Genalia. We have been developing analytical tools. These are open source tools that use the latest cutting edge technology in distributed computing to work with and flexibly explore and analyze large neural data sets. Our focus thus far has been functional measurements. So in particular, uh, things like optical physiology, calcium imaging experiments, like the one I showed you, but we are expanding to work with a variety of different kinds of data and a couple, I'm not going to go into any of the details, but the basic ideas behind what we're building, this is a library called Thunder, is to use, again, sort of new cut first or state of the art technologies for distributed computing, in particular uh, a platform that we've been using called Spark, and sort of from the ground up designed our analytics to be distributed, uh, designed them to be uh, runnable on cloud-based uh, computing architectures, for example, Amazon Web Services. Uh, provide support for a variety of, of, of formats, of sort of raw data formats, but also try to develop standard internal representations of data. Um, I think this world in which every lab is independently developing their own little pipeline to process their own kind of data and maybe writing a little NIPS paper about it, uh, about a particular algorithm they came up with, but then never exposing it to the broader community is not how we're going to make progress. Um, so the goal of, of this is really to try to take a real stab at bringing together a lot of different methods and a lot of different implementations of algorithms in a platform that we can all be using for the purpose of comparing uh, and developing our approaches. Um, I want to stress because it's incredibly important, this is 100% open source. Every component of it can be available free for download, uh, except of course paying for running it on EC2, which of course costs money, but uh, so does buying a computer. Um, and the links to everything is on GitHub right here. Uh, Thunder is this analytical library. Lightning uh, is a library that we've developed for the purpose of visualization. Um, I'll very quickly show you just one very, actually very simple example of, of what we do with this kind of analytics. Um, this is a case of an experiment, a very simple experiment, where we are measuring, again, whole brain activity over the zebrafish while presenting visual stimuli that have different directions. 
Um, so this is maybe the first experiment you would do when recording from monkey V1. We're just doing it over the entire brain. Um, so there are neurons in the zebrafish that are visually tuned, and we might expect those to pop out. We see actually a lot of other stuff too. So in this experiment, every few seconds, the stimulus in the upper left is changing direction, and we're looking at activity evolve. Just by watching the movie, you might notice that there's a relationship between the direction of the presented stimulus and the pattern of activity that evolves across the brain. We can do an analysis uh, essentially within uh, minutes or even seconds, despite this being a fairly massive volume of data, that pulls out direction selectivity across the brain. So what we're doing here is coloring actually every single voxel in this data set based on the degree to which the time series of its response was related to the time series of the presentation of the different directions. And what we get out is actually not just an image, but a volume that captures direction selectivity across the brain. And there are parts of the brain, uh, for example, the optic tectum, which is these guys here and here, where there's very clear direction selectivity, and that's exactly what we'd expect because these are areas involved in visual processing. Uh, the whole brain actually shows activity, and this actually reflects a complex mixture of sort of stimulus-driven responses as well as responses related to motor behavior because every time there's a stimulus, this guy will try to swim in response. Um, so these things are incredibly intermingled, and even in this fairly simple animal, at least compared to a human, there's a lot of behavioral work that needs to be done to understand what exactly is the relationship between their sensory processing and motor processing, what behavior should we develop to best use these technologies to explore their neural processing. Um, so this is the kind of analysis we might do. Uh, I think Jack made a really beautiful point yesterday that in a lot of these data sets, the biggest challenge is actually not just what analyses are we doing, but how are we going to visualize it? Um, so for this purpose, we've been building uh, actually our own sort of interactive visualization library. Again, this is open source. You can use it right now. Um, and just to give you a very brief idea of what this thing does, it's essentially a interactive visual visualization notebook. It runs on a server, but you can generate visualizations uh, in it from within, for example, our client library in Python. So it makes it very easy to be working in some interactive computing environment and just fire up visualizations, which include things like uh, three-dimensional representations of point cloud data, which is one way to uh, visualize some of the signals that come from these experiments, um, interactive plotting for doing things like uh, looking at a bunch of neural signals. In the top are, for example, signals from different uh, neurons based on their spatial location. Then down below, we're seeing the time series associated with that neuron. Um, these kind of fun diagrams, which provide ways of visualizing network structure. Um, and actually, everything in this little notebook is all from one experiment. So there are lots of different ways of looking at a single data set. And the idea of this library is to provide uh, people with the ability to develop custom interactive visualizations and use them in the context of large-scale analytics. Um, and finally, I think one of the most exciting uh, avenues for this, these kind of experiments and this kind of analysis is to be doing stuff in real time. Uh, so not just take a data set after the fact and look at it, but actually try to do analysis online during the experiment. And this is something we're doing uh, to some extent in the zebrafish, but also uh, in a very exciting collaboration uh, doing it in the mouse. And this is a collaboration with uh, Nick Hoffner and Carl Sabota. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, behaviors in the mouse. It's a mouse running on a ball in a virtual tactile environment. So this guy is running. And the walls that you can see on the right are motorized, and they're moving back and forth, uh, touching his whiskers to try to give him the sense that he is running through a virtual environment. <laughs> and the movement of the walls is in closed loop with his movement on the ball. So this guy basically thinks he's running around in a virtual corridor. Um, and we can simultaneously, this is a head fixed behavior, so we can do two photon imaging. Unlike uh, what we're doing in the zebrafish with this whole brain imaging, this is only looking at a small a uh, small fraction of the brain at once, but we can image fairly large populations of neurons, say thousands at a time, uh, and those numbers are increasing, and uh, we are working towards the ability to be monitoring activity across the brain, um, or at least across multiple areas. And one of the things that we're developing in this system is the ability to analyze this data using the same kind of analytics on the fly during the experiment. So on the left is a, a time-evolving movie of neural activity over a small patch of this animal's somatosensory cortex, and on the right, is a representation of, or a map of, functionally derived neural signals. In this case, the color is based on the relationship between the animal's, or the neural response, and the position of the walls relative to the animal as he's running through this corridor. So this is kind of giving us a live window. You know, the microscope gives us one live window, and then the real-time analysis gives us yet another window on top of that 
that actually tells us what these neurons are doing in real time. And this will let us start inter interfacing the analysis we're doing with the experiment. We can start doing things like, uh, for example, presenting particular stimuli based on the measurements that we're making, um, or even going in to do targeted manipulation. Let's say we want to find all of the blue cells and then ablate them or kill them and look at the effect of that on the animal's behavior. Um, again, I think behavior is incredibly important, and there was a lot of cool discussion on that yesterday. I think a lot of the ideas from human psychophysics and human behavior could be uh, kind of fruitfully brought to bear on some of the problems in these model systems. And with that, uh, I'm done. I just want to give a highlight to or a shout out to a group uh, sort of collective that we've been uh, organizing over the last uh, several months. This is something called Code Neuro. We had an event in uh, San Francisco in the fall in 2014, um, and we're going to have another event in the spring. This is a collective of neuroscientists, sort of hackers, people doing data visualization, data science. Um, and we had a lot of fun at our last event, um, and we will be doing uh, another one in the spring. So thank you very much. On to the next one. Um, okay, I just said that I really love this imaging technique, that they're amazing. Thank you. I, I, I'm curious, what do we know about transferring results from the zebrafish to the human? Um, that's a great question. Uh, so there are, uh, and there's a number, there are a number of ways to answer it. I mean, certainly at a sort of evolutionary level, one could point to structures in, the, in the, the zebrafish that are likely analogous to certain structures or sort of related to structures in the human, like the cerebellum, for example. Um, this is an area that my collaborator on this, Misha Arens, has looked at, uh, done a lot of beautiful work in. Um, I should say all of that work is in collaboration with Misha. And uh, so that's one way. I think there, are, at a slightly more abstract level, one can learn principles of neural coding by working in, for example, the zebrafish or even the mouse that will translate at a conceptual level, possibly, to the way we think about humans. Um, I, I previously did work actually in fMRI in humans and then monkey physiology, uh, a collaboration with Tony Mopshin, um in the monkey. And I think the ability in these systems to really get a comprehensive view of the, of the animal under study and the neural system under study, um, you know, really this idea that we want to look at as many neurons as possible at the resolution of single neurons, which is the resolution at which brains compute. Um, I think the ability to do that is extremely important and it will take a lot of work to make those conceptual leaps. But I think there are principles, hopefully, of neural coding that should show up across multiple systems. Um, and if they don't, then it's even more complicated than I think we all think. Just a uh, technical detail. Did, uh, did I hear you say these were embryo zebrafish? Larval zebrafish. Thank you. So the behavior that you see is uh, sort of the hardwired innate behavior uh, before it had exposure to the real world. So um, this, oh, I mean, I'm trying to understand yeah, if, so if, if, this would, if the results would change uh, you know, a lot if you actually look at the brain of an adult already trained. It's a great question. Um, so we have collaborators that, uh, actually, and, and also in, in Misha's lab to some extent, uh, also a collaborator, Minuro, uh, looking at sort of how things change over development. You can imagine doing these experiments as the fish develops um, mm -hmm. to look at that. I think a lot of the behaviors we do look at are innate. Um, mm -hmm. For example, the optimotor response when you present a stimulus, he tries to swim. Um, that's what I was showing before. Uh, Misha and, and others in the lab have done some really beautiful work on things, though, that do not appear to be kind of just reflexes. Um, they may still be innate, um, but there are sort of complicated innate responses. I think Bruno had some really nice examples of that yesterday. Um, going in the other direction, our uh, collaborator Philip Keller has done some really beautiful work imaging embryos. Um, so it's actually a system where I think you can maybe play to this as a strength where you can try to look at how things change, both in terms of neural activity and behavior over time. I guess the adults are not, don't have a transparent brain or something? Oh, sorry, yeah, that's a, a minor but very important technical point. The adults do not have, uh, are not transparent, so doing, and they're also much larger. Um, so both of those things make it difficult to do exactly this kind of recording in the adult. Okay, well, um, I'm, uh, I'm really going to talk mostly today about uh, the NIMH data repositories, which uh, my group and I manage. But I wanted to start um, and just a brief word about the Brain Initiative, uh, which I've been involved with at NIH. Uh, as uh, uh, 
it's been great to be in a room for a day and a half now with a group of people who care deeply about uh, both uh, neuroscience and about uh, computational approaches. And I just want to tell you that um, it's your sort of expertise that NIH really thinks we need in the Brain Initiative. There are a bunch of program announcements that are on the street right now. There's another series that's coming. Um, be happy to talk to you about opportunities in that area. And I'd also be really happy to talk to you about any potential barriers you see to computational scientists getting involved at, in the, at, at, at NIH. I see people nodding and smiling, so that's uh, something that some of you maybe have tried, and uh, we'll see with uh, what success. So I'm going to be around, and um, uh, please do come and talk to me about those things. But today, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the NIMH uh, data repositories. Um, and um, we're trying to do something that's uh, relatively difficult. Um, so for the f this, I think this is the first talk through the whole meeting that's going to talk a little bit about disease, right? Um, I come from the National Institute of Mental Health. And um, when you look at sort of the burden uh, due to a variety of diseases, DALIs or disability years, um, you see that um, mental and behavioral disorders are a very large number. Uh, this is in the U.S. Um, a couple, uh, 2010, right? You also see that many of the diseases that are on this graph are things that we might think of as um, there are collection there. There are symptoms involved, but the biological understanding of those symptoms is really um, not very well understood. So diabetes is a great example. Everyone with diabetes has high blood sugar. The underlying bi biological cause of that blood sugar varies. So there are subpopulations. You need to treat the subpopulations quite differently um, with different drugs, different uh, um, different sorts of interventions. In the, the brain disorders, um, since we understand, as we've heard over the past day and a half, so little about the brain, it's very hard to find those subgroups. So a lot of what I'm going to tell you today is, try, is talking about aggregating data from a large number of uh, humans who have disease and normal controls, trying to find differences. And that's an area I think that Everyone in the room, I think, should be challenged by that, and we would welcome your help. These databases are open to the public, and uh, um, and I think they're a rich source of uh, rich source of data. So, um, there are uh, in fact four uh, database infrastructures, but they all point back uh, to the same Oracle database. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about NDAR, the National Database for Autism Research. Um, there's a pediatric MRI uh, um, interface, and if you Google NDAR, you'll find it for those of you who are uh, um, uh, on computers. Uh, NDCT is the National Database for Clinical Trials. Those are all of the clinical trials supported by NIMH. And RDOC is our new approach at NIMH to trying to find um, better ways to describe uh, these subgroups. So that stands for Research Domain Criteria. and um, uh, of them all, though, NDAR is the oldest, and but the, the others are, are all very similar. So um, NDAR is a, is a data infrastructure. A couple of the institutes at NIH uh, support this. It's a federal data repository, um, which actually has some advantages, but I don't think I'll go into that at, uh, uh, today, but happy to talk to you about it offline. Uh, it contains uh, data from human subjects uh, related to autism and, uh, uh, as I said, normal controls. You can get it. You can get data fairly easily, but I'll show you that you can get summary data without even having to ask us for permission. You just go to the website and uh, poke around a little bit. Um, the data infrastructure was started in uh, around uh, 2008. Of um, uh, getting data into an infrastructure like this is very similar to filling a swimming pool with a garden hose. It takes a long time before there's enough water in the pool to do anything useful. I think over the past uh, 18 months or so, we've gotten to that point where there are enough data in the database to, to make, uh, um, to do some real science. Um, I say that because at this point, we do have over 77,000 subjects. Uh, we're holding over 500 terabytes of genomics and imaging data, image broadly defined uh, in the Amazon cloud. Um, and the, the, the reason I think I'm talking in this session, which is about heterogeneous uh, data, is that 
Uh, we don't tell the autism research community, here's the type of experiment you should do to probe such and such, a, you know, a, a, an area. We take in whatever they um, give us, and it's our job to try to put it together. Um, and I'm going to ask at the end for some help uh, with uh, uh, some of those uh, some of those issues. So um, when we started this, um, uh, there were several other autism uh, data repositories that already existed, and so we have pretty deep federation, meaning that you can go to NDAR, launch a query, the query gets launched across all of these data infrastructures. You can't get the subject level data from, let's say, Simons, unless you have a username and password at Simons, but you can see that they have data that you might want to have, and then you could go and, uh, uh, and apply to them for, for access. Uh, if you do have a password, uh, we provide all the data from all the sources that you're recognized at uh, through NDAR. So, um, you know, basically, at the end of the day, NDAR is a big matrix. Um, the two key organizing principles are um, data dictionaries, and I'll show you a little bit what our data dictionaries look like, and the GUID, uh, the Global Unique Identifier, which is a subject identifier. Um, Okay, so um, the data dictionaries, um, as I said, we don't uh, dictate how experiments are done. Uh, we simply take in the data uh, as it comes and then try to uh, curate it uh, uh, as much as we can. Uh, so uh, at this point, we have more than 500 instruments. Um, you can download the instruments. One of the nice things I think that does happen when you start to aggregate data is that research communities do start to look and compare exactly what they've done to exactly what other people have done. The, the data uh, repository makes that a little easier. Um, and um, the other thing that happens is that quality control is made a little easier as well. So um, here's, a, um, uh, here's an example of one of our data dictionaries, and there was a pointer here somewhere. This is mechanical. Mechanical pointer. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry, roll. So you know what I what I really just wanted to show were uh, there. Uh, thank you, perfect. Thank you. That's a good one. So uh, uh, those are ah um, oh, there it is. Sorry, thanks. Let me give you back the mechanical pointer. So uh, um, those are the allowable values for a particular element in this data dictionary. Um, we don't take the data in unless it uh, corresponds to one of the, you know, if it, unless it's in that range. So there is a little, we do enforce, you know, um, some standards, um, but then it's up to somebody if, oh, if, there it is, if, if zero to 24 is how this instrument um, talks about uh, communication, social interaction, it's up to us or someone else who cares about ontologies to uh, compare that zero to 24 to another scale that might go one to eight or negative two to six or whatever. Um, um, however, uh, the database, uh, because we've got a lot of subjects, um, you can just go in and uh, uh, poke around and look at data distributions. Uh, you can filter this by uh, sex, age, whatever, uh, whatever you care about. Uh, and uh, you can quickly uh, sort of compare your data to this data. Um, a, a very satisfying number of uh, grant applications are now coming into NIH using this as preliminary data to go and explore areas. And I think that's uh, certainly a great, um, a great role for data infrastructures like this. Um, the other building block is the GUID, um, the Global Unique Identifier. Um, this is a great little piece of software that sits at the research site, um, lets a researcher put in uh, first name, last name, date of birth, place of birth, sex, and um, it hashes that information at the site and sends us the hash data. If we've seen that hash data before, those hash codes, we return the same uh, random ID that we returned the first time. Um, if it's a new person, they get a new ID. What this really lets us do is uh, it lets us not hold personally identifiable information in a federal data repository, which is a bad thing, um, and uh, it still allows us to merge data from the same subject seen in different laboratories, and it actually does work. Um, of course, there's a logical limit here that 
if you keep doing this, you end up generating your own social security number, just calling it a GUID. So we have some, uh, we're working, we've uh, implemented some solutions to that, which again, I'd be happy to talk about um, um, offline. So a uh, query is, um, uh, is obviously important in any uh, uh, infrastructure like this. So you can, you can query uh, data from a particular laboratory, data associated with a paper, or any, subject, any subset of data that someone thinks is interesting. We're assigning DOIs to all of the data from papers now and to a number of other ways of segregating data in the database. Uh, you can do queries just on any element in a data dictionary, but what I really want to talk about is the query by concept, um, because I think that you may, may, there may be people either in the room or online who can help with this. So what does query by concept mean? Um, well, suppose uh, over here, um, suppose that you're inter interested in excessive repetitive action, that that's what you would want to find all the subjects in the database uh, who have autism and show excessive repetitive action. Great. Um, well, how do you do that? Um, remember, there are 500 data dictionaries, so um, you would have to know something about all 500 of those data dictionaries in order to launch that query, unless you uh, you know, unless you had prior knowledge. That's painful. Um, we have worked with, uh, in this case, Alexa McRae, and she's decided um, that in this instrument, the CBCL question number 66, if you have a one or two in that question, that subject did show excessive repetitive motion. And here are other questions in other um, uh, data dictionaries that uh, um, also show that. So, you know, if you launch this query by concept, um, you end up getting 750 subjects. Um, you might disagree with the boundaries that, that Alexa has set up and that we've implemented, but at least this is a starting point and then you can go and start to poke around, you know, with other things. Um, that's uh, painful, right? Uh, um, so um, one of the, you know, this is my last slide, help I'd like from, uh, uh, from uh, people. Um, first, are there computational methods um, to aid in this definition of concept, uh, query concepts? Um, I think that's a, um, I think that really is a, a big deal for us moving forward. Um, second, we've got this large sparse matrix. It's got 77,000 subjects in one dimension. It's got 50,000 data elements in the other dimension. Um, are there good ways to sort of try to find overlaps between common instruments? We would very much like to help the research community settle on a small number of really useful instruments or questions from those instruments rather than continuing to collect data from very large numbers of, of instruments. Um, are there ways to find uh, correlations between imaging data and clinical data that, you know, that we have uh, um, uh, in this sparse matrix? And I want to get back to where I started, that um, a key issue in mental illness is defining the subgroups. There's not, an aut there's not an autism, there are 10 autisms, 50 autisms, 100 autisms, we really don't know. Um, but what we do know is that there's data from all of those subgroups likely in the database, and we'd really like to have help thinking about how do we define those subgroups and then going out and promoting experimental tests of that. So with that, uh, I'll end, and uh, I'm happy to answer any burning questions if there are any. So it's, uh, it's good to see that um, you're making progress, but I understand that there have been some databases that haven't been as successful. And I, I wonder if you could tell us, you know, what, what uh, uh, makes, uh, what, what's needed, uh, and, and what are the failure modes, and how do we avoid them? So uh, I, I, uh, I'll, I'll speak. Um, not as a federal official to answer that question, um, but as just someone who's been observing uh, databases for uh, uh, for a while, um, I often think that um, I often think the code that comes out of uh, biological labs, in particular, isn't really all that robust, and that that's uh, an important failure mode in 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 many cases. Thank you. That's <laughs> it. Um, I mean, I do have, I, I didn't tell you, I have a team of 
15 people who work on this. Um, they are professional, um, you know, coders, computer scientists. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, it does take a big effort to make something like this work. Um, I also think you have to stick with it um, because in year three of this database, if someone had asked, how many papers have you generated, uh, the answer would have been zero, maybe one, you know. Uh, um, it takes a while to get to that point where the database is useful, and so you have to have a five, ten year horizon before you start to really ask the question, was that investment worthwhile? That's a big investment to get to that point. So. I, there may be other reasons, but I think those are probably the the, 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 the most important. So there was a question over there. Thank you. Two related questions. Uh, um, the first of all is tracking provenance for this data so that you know how it came there. And second of all is uh, giving credit. So site people being able to cite the data that they then use in their data sets. Right, so we do, um, uh, we do have the provenance question. We know exactly where all the data comes from, and that's the data from lab. And I didn't show any of that, but you can easily figure out where the data came from. Provenance is a, is a harder issue. Uh, we're hoping that the DOI solution is going to help us with provenance, but um, I'm uh, I'm very happy to talk to you about, uh, you know, other better ways to do that because it's clear as a community that until in your bio sketch you can put something like a DOI and have next to it number of times downloaded and number of papers that that DOI can, you know, that the data in that you know, da data spot contributed to, that you're not, the, the researcher who measured the data is not really getting appropriate credit. I think that the DOI is actually going to make that pretty straightforward, but the infrastructure isn't quite there yet. So, last Thank question. Brain, in your case, does also include a spinal cord <laughs> data, or is it separate? Um, I don't think we have. It's not. I, I don't think we have anything from the spinal cord. Uh, but that's not, if someone sent us that data, we would. So you're not aware that there is something like a spinal cord injury uh, database? I, I, I know that we don't like have that. anything like that at the moment. <coughs> right. Thanks. Um, I'm Joshua Vogelstein. I'm going to talk about some of the opportunities and challenges associated with open science platforms for heterogeneous data. Um, so to start, I'll give you a bit of a history of uh, big scientific data at Johns Hopkins, where I am. The Sloan Digital Skies Survey came out of Johns Hopkins. It's about a decade old now. It's arguably the most successful big scientific data uh, database ever. There's billions of queries against it and uh, hundreds of thousands of citations and about every single astronomy, uh, every single professional astronomer has an account into this database to access it. Uh, so that is a great success story. I had nothing to do with that. I was, I was like in grad school. Um, since then, Hopkins started the Institute for Data Intensive Engineering and Sciences. Um, they have now over 11 petabytes of scientific data, including, since I got there, about 600 terabytes of heterogeneous brain data. And this includes, started with serial electron microscopy, now includes a bunch of clarity data from Carl Dizeroff, uh, array tomography data from Stephen Smith at Stanford, calcium physiology data, some of which from Jeremy uh, and Misha. Um, and multimodal MRI data. And so the first question for me is what should a system do? Um, in my head it should do these five things. It should do lots of other things too, but one thing would be nice is anybody can upload anything. I think the last talk demonstrated something like that. Um, I mean a little bit less anything than you mean. <laughs> I mean in particular mostly different modalities of brain imaging data. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, the next step is scalable computer vision that works. Some of these data sets are literally hundreds of terabytes, and you need to do computer vision algorithms on them. So it doesn't fit in RAM. You have to do something else. And so there's a lot of problems with that. Um, then you have to do queries. You talked about queries. 
You have to do queries here across hundreds of terabytes of data. So you have to efficiently find things. And these things might be local and they may not be. And that introduces lots of computer science problems. Uh, we need to have uh, UEs to integrate with analysis and visualization packages like the ones Jeremy's been building. And then also we need new statistical machine learning methods because there aren't methods that address some of the, the challenges that we face with this kind of data. So let's skip that and go through a all of those a little bit more slowly, or some of them a little bit more slowly. Here's Terry's slide again. Does this thing work? This guy. Lots of different kinds of data, different spatiotemporal scales. This is an image of Jeremy's data that we pulled from our database. And when people talk about big data, they talk about four Vs. Two of those Vs are variety and velocity. Right? So we have this problem. Uh, here, the variety, there's many different types of data. And velocity, some of the data rates can exceed a terabyte per hour per machine. And so if you have a lab with five machines, it's running 24 hours a day, you're getting hundreds of terabytes a day. Right? And we need to have streaming algorithms. This is for all the computer scientists in the room. Streaming algorithms, we need them. <laughs> right? we, you can't wait till the data is finished being generated because it takes 100 days to, right now to generate the most recent big data set, which is 100 terabytes. If you wait 100 days and then start the ingest process, 200 days later, you can start doing some computer vision if that takes 100 days. 300 days later, now you can start looking at the data. Right? That's not going to work. You need to be doing things in real time, basically. Um, okay, S scalable computer vision that works. Hans Peter can attest to this being a really big challenge. He's been working on it for five years. He's made tremendous progress, and we're still, I think he would like a lot more help, <laughs> um, probably both financially and for more humans working on it. And uh, this is, this is a, a problem that Jeremy faces also. When the data doesn't fit in RAM, you can't load it in MATLAB or ImageJ or something like that and run your computer vision algorithm. And also, you can't look at all the data when it's a petabyte. Even if you had a thousand people looking at 100 bytes a day or a second or whatever, it takes years to just look at it. So we need fully automatic, not semi-automatic, fully automatic solutions that work robustly on new data sets that come in um, and to do all sorts of these steps. And so just to show you a couple examples, this is what some of the raw images look like on a particular electron microscopy data set. You can see there's all sorts of color normalization issues that needs to be fixed. Then we need to find all sorts of objects. We need to track all sorts of things. And then we want to estimate connectivity from this. And so that's a hard problem. And we've developed some solutions. Other people have developed some solutions. We're working on integrating them together uh, to have a complete system. But um, th that's some of the challenges with that. The next challenge, again, this is for computer scientists in the room, spatial semantic queries. So if I want to extract a dendrite that's in this big volume, that's 100 terabytes. If I just get the bounding box, that bounding box is 100 terabytes. So I can't just cut that out and do stuff. I want to do kind of sparse cutouts around the semantic information. So I need a spatial database that also is somehow linked to an annotation database that has semantic ontologies associated with it. So I can do queries like, find me all the synapses quickly and tell me their volumes. And then I plug that into Jeremy's thing, for example. Now I can do analysis on, say, do, what's the distribution of volumes of synapses, things like this. Uh, the nice thing about building a spatial database is that it works for all sorts of different kinds of data. So we apply it to electron microscopy data, to Jeremy's time series data, to multimodal MRI data, et cetera. Um, Jeremy already talked about his analysis and visualization stuff, so I'll just say that's really important. We need more of that. And then um, there's some statistical machine learning issues here. So there's a bunch of people in the room who do this kind of thing, so it's worth pointing out that the data that come out of these data sets, it's not vectors. I mean, you can obviously represent them as vectors if you want. But they're more complicated objects. They're networks, they're shapes, they're multivariate time series. Um, and so standard methods that take in Euclidean dimensions, finite Euclidean dimensional data, and a bunch of them, we don't have that. We've got like a million shapes, and each one's infinite dimensional. 
And how do you do, say, discriminant learning on that? It's not that easy. And there really aren't tools that do it sufficiently well right now. In the last two minutes, I wanted to say how to fail. Because um, I think it's important. Like, Terry just asked about failure modes. So here's a bunch of failure modes. One, work in isolation. These problems are hard. If you're a biologist or a computer scientist and you're trying to solve this problem on your own, I expect you will fail. And I expect that because a lot of people have tried that so far and failed. Um, another way to fail is only put one graduate student on it. I've noticed a lot of people have done this. It turns out when that graduate student graduates, the code dies and no one else can ever run it again. And then it's not useful. So it was maybe useful for a year, but that's the end of it. Don't let the graduate student leave. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you have that kind of pull, Terry. I don't know that. Um, uh, the third thing, and this is again, if you want to succeed, not if you want to have fun, because like, you know, there's a balance here. If you want to succeed, work on something that you're an expert on. Like, if you know how to build spatial databases, great, we need them. Build them for us. If you don't know how to do that, you can work on it if it's fun for you, but like, it's really probably not going to help because other people can be doing it better. And there's like real hard engineering problems here. Um, for write code that nobody else can run, this is a weird problem that we discovered because we try to integrate a bunch of code. Someone publishes a paper, maybe in Mackay or Nips. And we say, oh, great, they made the code open source, like Jeremy. We'll run it. We run it. It doesn't run. It just doesn't run. No one else has ever tried to run it except that guy who wrote it. And we contact him. Hey, it doesn't run. OK. I mean, he's on to the next project. right? So we always work with alpha testers, other people running our code to make sure that they can run it. And not only can they run it, they get the same results. Because we've literally, I think, never gotten the same results as anyone has published when we run their code. And I don't think it's a bug in our code because we just run their code. Right? So something is awry, and you need to make it such that other people can run your code and get the same answers. Um, and the last thing is, if you work on problems that you know are publishable inside your community, that might be really great. And I know there's lots of really good reasons to do that. But there's lots of engineering challenges that might not be so easy to publish, like stitching together a billion images, which maybe is hard to publish, but no one can do it well. And it's a real bottleneck in progress right now. So how to succeed is the opposite of those things. I mean, you can imagine what they are. Um, and then uh, this is people and things I want to thank. And I'm done. Thank you. Yes, Jack. I share your concern that uh, when you get somebody else's code to run, or when somebody even just you know, puts something on GitHub, it's oftentimes very difficult to get it to run. Um, one thing I have noticed the last few years that's been really cool is people putting their code in IPython notebooks and releasing their IPython notebook along with their paper, either as a supplement materials thing or on a GitHub with a link. So then you know, that makes it very convenient to just interactively run the, run the thing and if it doesn't work, you can immediately figure out why. So um, I just wanted to point out that I thought yeah, that was no, a great that's, trend. That's a great point. And that's, there's definitely lots of options like IPython Notebook that make it much easier to share runnable code and reproducible science. Yeah. Another really quick point, because it's totally related. <laughs> I'm completely with Jack on this. And we, we do a lot of stuff with the IPython Notebook. Also, uh, new ways of deployment. Um, so you know, a huge issue with a lot of sharing of code is just everyone's running in different environments. But for example, if you have uh, sort of standard ways of setting up an EC2 instance that's going to run your analyses, and everybody sets up the same EC2 instance, then you're all running the exact same environment. And there's some really cool new things like Docker that are making this really, really easy to basically have a bunch of people not just running the same code, but running in the same environment. And this also solves a lot of that. Yeah, so, so uh, Josh started out by saying that some of these astronomy databases have been very successful. Uh, have been very successful. Another one that's been very successful has been the Hubble Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, so this is a, a decision that was made by um, the, you know, at the very beginning when they started giving out grants. Now, the equivalent of an R01 is to give an astronomer some time, you know, 10 hours, 100 hours for a particular star or a particular galaxy, 
and then they publish a paper, and you know that's the unit of progress. Well, what R Ricardo uh, Giacconi, the director, made a decision. He was going to give half the money for archival data, mm -hmm. which means that uh, they had to design the, the project well ahead of time, thinking ahead about who's going to be using it, calibrate it so that it can be compared to future data. And that's 10 times more difficult than going and looking at your star and ma making a measurement and publishing it. Yep. But it, even though it was more expensive, uh, <clears throat> and the fact that it you know, required a tremendous amount of design and uh, execution, half the papers that are now being published from Hubble are from the archival data, because people are now collecting more data and comparing it and seeing what happened back you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And it, but the point is that it, 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 you, you just can't archive the, the one-offs, the R01s. That, that's not very helpful, because yeah. you can't compare them very easily. And, and, and it's not annotated properly. So I think that a lot of effort has to put up front when you give out the grants from the beginning. There has to be resources put in to design the experiment properly and to maintain the data. And that's not being done right now. But let's hope that the Brain Initiative will change that. I'm Sean Hill, first of all, from uh, Lausanne, Switzerland, the Human Brain Project, but I also work in, in Stockholm uh, with the INCF, the International Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility. And um, in fact, I, I mean, there's, this conversation is, is really, really good because it's bringing up this issue of, first of all, experience from other fields, from astronomy, but also what is it we need to do early and often in terms of making sure that data is actually reusable. And, um, and the fact is, is that we've got, as <clears throat> excuse me, as we've been talking about throughout this time, we've got a tremendous diversity of data, and we've got lots of it. So that's not an issue. And it's coming from across all different scales. It's coming from all different modalities. Um, but the question is, is, what are we going to do with that? How are we going to start to assemble an integrated view onto what this data can tell us? Is it that we're always going to have to rely on one single group doing everything in a completely controlled way? Or are we going to start developing the culture where we can actually assemble and reuse some of this data? And the, of course, we know that there are a lot of issues uh, with reusing data. But key is that we're, I mean, we're seeing that a lot of studies are not reproducible. Right. And having the data and making sure that the data itself is well enough annotated, you have access to the raw data, that you can actually use it to help you reproduce a result is also really, really key. And I'll get back then to this issue that have been, has been brought up several times. There are other fields that have worked on these issues that have solved the problems, at least within their fields, to, to, to a significant degree. And one of those is in astronomy, uh, the International Virtual Observatory Alliance. And they actually built about 15 years ago an infrastructure to aggregate, integrate data from all around the world, from all these observatories uh, that, are, that are measuring in different modalities, and they're, they're measuring with different instruments, and they wanted to put them together to get an integrated view of the sky. And uh, <clears throat> they actually built a, an infrastructure to do that, and consisting of a, of a registry, and then data access layer, data models, query layers, uh, and then all of that is a set of services that others can use to build applications to actually go out and query the data and assemble it into the picture that's needed for that analysis. And as Terry was pointing out, now I mean it's actually 60% of the papers in astronomy are you built off of archival data, and these are high impact papers. Right. So this is this is really something to learn from, um, and. There are a number of these tools. So you've, they've got a variety of clients where you can go and you can basically query for a region of the sky and find at a particular spectrum what data is available, what images, where did it come from, this type of thing. And this has been used partially in, in things like the Worldwide Telescope and in Google Sky. Right? So this then becomes a general data source for a, a broad variety of applications. And I think it's really key to think about, well, what what is the uniquely, so, so in astronomy, they had to think about how do we uniquely locate these observations of the sky? How do we position them in a space so that we can combine them? And for the sky, it's sort of easy, right? You've got 360 degrees, you've got a sky map, and you can basically say from this, at this location, this angle, this, this time, we measured, uh, so a cube of data. It's basically a, a square, and then across a spectrum. 
and you've got a, they call these data cubes from the sky. Now, the question is, is if we want to build a virtual brain observatory, what would that mean? What would, what would be our data cube? And um, I think that this is where it would be useful to think about what would those key identifiers be that could actually just be lightweight to provide, be able to position an observation in a unique space that you can actually start to combine that data. And of course, this points out the need, but this is where the astronomy group started, was just a data registry, just a place to say, I've got this data. The data has a contributor. It's about a particular specimen in the, in the brain. Now, this specimen, can, we know, can have many different scales, but it could also be a, a GUID. It could be a human. Um, there are specific methods, so the description of the, the context. Now, the thing is, is all of these things will have a lot of additional supplementary information. But what you really need is you just need a unique identifier to start. You just need to uniquely identify the specimen, the methods, the location in, in a particular brain space. And we learned a lot about brain atlases during this workshop, where there are lots of different potential ways of, of creating atlases that can be combined, or generative models that can combine uh, data. Sure, and, do you have a unique identifier? <laughs> I've got several, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean no, I'm talking about when you publish a paper. Do you put a unique identifier for you? In the paper? So, or ORCID IDs are the unique identifier for researchers when you publish a paper? You know, uh, the, 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 there are a lot of people who have common names. Right, and like me, so, Sean. And, and this, if you can't solve that problem. Absolutely. But this is where ORCID IDs actually help. So I, I was one of the first to sign up for an ORCID ID because S. Hill is really, really common. And um, so this was, and a Sean Hill is also really common. So the same thing for, data types and data access, the URL ultimately, where can you go to access this? So these are, in my mind, and, and this has been worked on, for, on, on a number of specific examples, but I would love to get feedback, thoughts on this. Are these sufficient um, as just the basic high-level unique identifiers that could position an observation in a, in a way that you could usefully start to, when you start to expand the semantics for those, actually combine them. And that's so something that in the Human Brain Project we started to do, is to build a knowledge graph. And this is a place where data can be registered, uh, discovered, and accessed and used. And it can be either biological data, biological observations, or models, or simulation output. Because we actually want to use the same semantics to talk about uh, sim simulated data as we do for biological data so that we know which comparisons really make sense. So there's a core data model, and it represents in vivo and in vitro and silico entities. Repre it's the, the scale is representing observations. So this may be a single observation or a set of ob observations that are all captured in the same way. And describing the properties using ontologies, recording where an entity or observation is located, tracks how the data is produced and who performed the experiment. And that's important because, so this whole data model is basically an extension of the W3C provenance uh, model. So this is a way where, to, to whatever extent you know the provenance, you can annotate all the details of the provenance and get a graph to analyze and, and be able to give credit to be able to identify which analysis algorithm was used, and so on. And the semantic annotation then becomes really the key to your search. That if you identify that I'm using this particular protocol and I've got a unique identifier for that protocol, and that those sets of protocols get curated with the semantics to say, well, this is actually it's another one of a whole cell patch clamp method, uh, but it's, it's actually very comparable to another method, so therefore data from that should be combinable. Uh, in different areas, you start to get uh, uh, semantics that help guide the integration. So I'll be um, I'll skip through this, but there you need to describe your specimen, how it was prepared, how the specimen was prepared, by whom, from uh, using which methods, and then I just take a quick example where we went into a particular data set produced by a Chinese group. This is an eight terabyte uh, data set from uh, optical imaging, and it's from a whole brain Golgi stain preparation. 
Um, it's actually sampled at one micron by 0.35 by 0.35. And you can go in and, and basically uh, take a look, zoom into any particular area of it, pull, pull out a subvolume. And from that subvolume, then run algorithms to extract features, pull out a feature. And again, you use the provenance information to track where in that large volume did it come from, what is the extracted feature, uh, how would you categorize that feature based on uh, morphological characteristics, and get a whole set of these extracted features. Well, you want to still be able to search for those, and, um, and then basically query them to do particular things, like build a model. Um, here, query an area, query for a sample of a particular region of somatosensory cortex, find the individual extracted neuron morphologies. Uh, here's a particular neuron morphology that's been re reconstructed, get the electrophysiology, get the gene expression, and then you can build essentially a model neuron from that with your algorithms and keep track of that uh, through the provenance model. So you know all who contributed to that. And then you can imagine taking this, and this is a, a rough prototype that we've built, taking different layers of data from the Allen Institute, but also from Vern, to build a sort of a very rough first draft uh, data-driven model of a rodent brain um, using nissel stain data to estimate cell densities. And go, so going through and converting the, the nissel stain into a, into a density function, using that to generate uh, uh, populations of neurons or cells, and then using gene expression data to identify, well, which subset of those are actually uh, glial cells, where's the white matter, t subtracting out uh, from the nissel stain and the, and the cell density, subtracting out those cell populations so that you start to assign specificity and different cell types to this. And this is where you, know, you take out the glial cell distribution, the, identify the inhibitory cell population. Now, all of this data we know is very coarse at this stage, but it's a, it's a prototype of doing a data-driven building process uh, and integrating data from different sources, including these DTI fiber tracks from a mouse brain, and those have all been aligned to a common atlas space um, in the Allen. And then by putting all of that together and using also some of the Allen data to further uh, refine and validate from the DTI data and then predict the synapse distributions, you can use that to build a whole brain point neuron model. It's very basic at this stage, but it shows that through just data alone, integrated into a common framework, you can actually build something uh, that could be then simulated and tested and serve as a framework for more refinement. Anyway, that's um, the starting point for discussion. <clears throat> Is this, uh, Sean, uh, is the thing you describe now is part of what you do in Stockholm? So uh, the, the knowledge graph and everything is, is all based at HPP, but, they will, the, but HPP will give it open source to, to everybody. Um, so the idea of the, the registry and these standard identifiers and the ontologies there, that's work in, in Stockholm. Um, Sean, this is Ken. Um, I think this is really great, and especially, you know, just it's important to usher in this culture of um, of, of of really trying to integrate across uh, across experiment. Um, one of the disanalogies between the brain world and astronomy is that um, astronomical objects have relatively simple behavior, and um, and 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 so I think you know getting at uh, get, trying to get a handle on interaction, behavior, um, intention, motivation, things like that, I think is 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 a genuinely hard problem. And you know, just describing uh, behavioral and cognitive states um, in a useful way um, is, uh, is 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 hard. So so, how how do you see um, making progress on that kind of uh, of of challenge? So I think I think that's. Um it's hugely important, and there's been far too little work done on developing uh, ontologies of behavior. Um, and <laughs> um, so the, 
the, the issue is, is that we need to be systematic in actually characterizing and defining what it is we're studying um, and, have, and have ways of just you know, sharing that description. And um, you know, in general, that hasn't happened so far. Terry so, has yeah, a... Uh, as a footnote, Behavior is very complex, especially cognitive behaviors. But there's really been a breakthrough within the last five years on automating behavioral analysis using machine learning. And just to give a few examples, at Tunelia, for example, uh, they, they say flies, fly brains. But it turns out flies have really complex behaviors. Uh, it's it's, it's you know, not as complex as ours, but the point is that uh, previously, you had to go frame by frame, and the human had to look at it and classify, is this a fly? wiggling its wing, is it, a, is it a mating dance, or is it uh, looking for food? But now that's, that's all been automated, so that you have very high throughput uh, classification of specific behaviors that are very, very fast, that you know, you'd miss if, with the human eye, and discovery using unsupervised methods of new behaviors that weren't even seen. So this is happening now across the board, mouse behaviors, human behaviors, just to give one other example, Facial expressions. So it used to be the case uh, you had to use Paul Ekman's fax system. Every single muscle had to be categorized frame by frame. It took you know an hour to do just a, 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 a few a minute of a video just to do it by hand uh, to classify each particular frame. Well, now we have with machine learning, we have we have, it's been done, uh, it's completely automated. You can do it in real time. Uh, you can do uh, you know uh, a scene with 100 faces in real time. And, uh, and that's revolutionizing the behavioral analysis of humans. How are they reacting to a particular uh, stimulus? Or how are they interacting with each other? Uh, how, 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 are, how is this in a medical context? How, is, how, how, does it, how do people's expressions change depending on the con you know, their, 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 their medical problem, uh, if they have mental health problem, or you know, marketing. So it turns out that uh, this is, uh, I think it's, it's, this is the, the golden age of behavior right now, is that there'll be tremendous uh, advances simply by the fact that these big databases are being generated and we have tools for analyzing them. So um, first I wanted to thank the panel for some thought-provoking uh, presentations. I, I actually learned quite a lot just listening to, to what you discussed. Uh, I'm curious though, so uh, I get a sense a lot of the discussion is about how do we get data into the repository? But there's the flip side of that, which is now once you've got a lot of data, what are the tools, what are the access methods, what level of sophistication do you need on the part of the user community to actually pull the data out and actually make use of it? And I was wondering if you could talk just a little bit about where we are in, in that ecosystem. Can the average biologist come in and actually use the data in these data sets, or is there still a, a, a gap that needs to be closed before that's possible? So I can talk for... For our stuff, there's a, we design everything to use RESTful calls. And so you can go to a simple URL, um, decide what data set you want, name the data set, name the zoom, name the X min, Y min, uh, Z min, and maxes. And if it's time series, also the time bounding area. And, hit and just enter that into the URL, and you will get an HDF5 file or a NumPy pickle or something else, if you tell us you really want something else, we will give you that, and then you can load it into whatever you want. Uh, and so it's incredibly easy to access arbitrarily sized sub-volumes of data, and this it's the exact same access pattern for every different data format we have. So serial electron microscopy, clarity, time series, uh, MRI, it's all the same. So I, 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 I I think I'd take a little bit of a different stab at that. Um, so with human subjects data, you do have a different level of concern about giving the data out. Many groups actually now are, the Human Connectome Project is a great uh, uh, exemplar of this, where you can pretty much go to their website and get images um, from uh, humans without um, doing much other than saying, I'm not going to do anything bad with the data. Um, we we have a little bit of a you know a, 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 a little better or a little more uh, process takes a little longer, but I, I I think an important component here that gets back to some of the other things that have been talked about in um, moving data is 
of these sizes is just not really possible. Um, uh, the Moore's Law for moving data is not moving fast enough when you're talking about hundreds of terabytes, and I have a feeling that our data is going to grow um, so that we maybe always are going to be behind, which means that these putting the data in the cloud in a centralized repository and instantiating workflows so that any biologist can go and, and either rerun the same workflow on their data that they've uploaded or tinker with the, the analysis parameters and see what the effect is. I think that has a, an important uh, place in where we're going here. And I think, I think it has to really be done in the cloud. I think it's more secure for the data as well. One, another uh, maybe point about uh, easy ways of getting a lot of people to sort of try to access the data and show uh, show people how is is really examples, 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 examples. I think in all the stuff we've done, uh, it's the most useful thing has been to basically not just sort of tell people what the tools are, or even tell people how to use them, but just say here is a data set and here is an IPython notebook that shows you how to use these analysis tools that we've developed to load the data, look at the data, analyze it get out some representation that hopefully conveys some kind of biological meaning. And if you get people that far, for enough for them to just reproduce that, then they can say, oh, that's cool. I want to try to do it differently, or I want to apply it to my data. And now you have a sort of small ecosystem grind where people are, are actually trying these things and using them. But if you don't take people to that point where they can essentially do exactly what you did and look at things the way you did, then they're very unlikely to want to use it. I think a, a core part of that challenge is the heterogeneity of the data. And um, I mean, there have been different separate online virtual research environments for different types of data um, with varying degrees of success. Um, I think we, you know, we have a, new examples, we have cloud infrastructure that are, that's making it possible to put an entire research environment online. But we, but we also need to make sure that we don't create many more silos of separate places of working when you actually want to combine these data. So I, th I think that's where the core ability of being able to discover data and have services where you can discover and access them in a generic way are, is really fundamental. Um, the, the web gives us a lot of those technologies and, and serve it, I mean there are groups who, have to, who are dealing with very large data sets have already come up with key services that can serve up those very large data sets. Uh, I think that's you know that's going to be the answer is a core infrastructure that can serve up data wherever you are. If I could just follow up quickly, so one of the things I just wanted to sharpen uh, a little bit on this was you know Josh, for example, said, well somebody can go to this URL and get the data. That doesn't mean they can do anything that's with right. the data. And so right. my concern is right. what's the level of uh, tool set and analysis you need to make the average biologist or the average neuroscientist, whoever. Uh, be able to do interesting science with the data, and are we there, or do we have a long ways to go? I think th there's an example of um, SPM and FreeSurfer, I mean, in the neuro neuroimaging community, and um, I think that comes with pluses and minuses, right? It's very easy to use, it's very easy to run uh, tests, statistical tests for significance, but very often uh, there hasn't been sufficient training to know, well, are you doing something valid when you're running something very easy? So I think it's, it's you know, there, there are in different communities, there are valuable tools that make things much easier, but you still have to make sure that there's the training to, to understand how to use the tools. So I had a follow-on question to your presentation, Sean, which was you talked about provenance as a way of integrating the data sets to know that that was related in some ways, but do you see other uses of that? In right, the yeah, so I didn't take the time to explain it, but actually it's very, very central to, to building up new indexes that can, that can basically give credit to all those who are contributing and develop new incentives for people to share data. So it's reproducibility, it's integration, but it's also, um, let's build an index that says, hey, you know, this guy is the guy producing an enormous amount of data and giving it out. Uh, it's being reused this often. It's uh, this valuable. It's contributed, uh, you know, an enormous amount to another project. All of these things can be analyzed through those provenance graphs, and I think that's essential. But this is sort of one step. Um, and typically when you talk about provenance, there's the debugging. So people downstream find that there's issues. Do you see that? And that's a much more complicated type of question that you're asking. 
do you see a use for that? In the well, I, I mean, I, I think that um, when you really want to reproduce a result, right, and you can trace back through, well, to the raw data from when it was captured and all the steps of analysis that happened in between, though that's a tool for debugging, it's a tool for, for reproducing the result. I'm not sure uh, if I got your point, but haven't done that yet, is that correct? No, I mean, this is, we're, we're building the provenance trees now, but then, then the question is the tools to actually enable. There is a platform um, called Synapse from Sage Bionetworks, and this, I've um, been very inspired by that, um, which actually lets you do analysis in an online cloud environment, tracks all the provenance, and, um, and that's very useful for then sharing to another team of people or another individual, the ent entire analysis and how you did it, so that they can take kind of fork off of that and create a new result. So I have a comment and a follow up to Greg's comment about getting the data out of the databases. So we used one of the data data repositories that Greg mentioned, dbGaP specifically, and I was astounded at how easy, easy it was procedurally to get it once we knew what we wanted. It's sort of you file an application and two days later it comes back saying, here's the link, download the data, and we actually did move a bunch of terabytes of data down to our local, mm -hmm. local drives. Um, one thing, though, is that we knew exactly what we wanted. We went in not because our collaborators said the easiest way for us to give you the data is to tell you to get go to dbGaP and get it from there because otherwise we would have to go through the entire process we went with them, with you. And so we knew exactly what study we wanted and exactly what to ask for because they told us and then it was easy. And so I think my comment would be that we're still not at a point where if I have vague idea of what I want to explore and I go, for example, into dbGaP, which is the genetics repository, how do I find data sets that are similar to, that, that match my research goal? So that's a comment. And the other question that I have that is a little bit separate, and again, I think it's more of a comment or a question for a general community. It seems like there is a lot of discussion about how do we acquire data because we clearly don't have enough data. Jack wants lots of crummy data. At least then we won't be bounded. <laughs> Okay, good. So he wants a lot of good data, and so we talk a lot about what kind of imaging tools we need to acquire the data. And then we talk about lack of good theories to explain what's going on in the brain. And to me, it seems like there is a gap between being able to get the data out of the database, however fantastic it is, and then converting it into something that can be matched up with the theories. Typically, the theories are made based on much higher level variables than what you can get from voxels. So there is a whole gap of what I call image analysis tools, which is basically methods that look at images and extract information that you care about. So for ex as an example, Hans Peter's work on doing segmentation of the microscopy images that goes from voxels to actual pictures of dendrites. Jack and Bertrand's work on looking at fMRI and extracting sim sort of almost symbolic, although quantitative, representations of networks and how they interact with it. And it feels like that part always gets forgotten about. So again, it's more of a comment than a question. But it feels like the medium part that takes voxels and extracts information that neuroscientists can build hypotheses about has been sort of missing in our discussions. I think that that's, I mean, it's one of the most fundamental things. There's all this feature extraction. It's very domain-specific, um, very modality specific, and it's core to being able to, to do any type of analysis of clustering, uh, defining new categories, new classes. So, I mean, it's, I think it's, a, it's a clearly an area that needs a lot of work. Um, I mean, all of the machine, all of the visual uh, kind of machine vision that's needed to do segmentation in um, EM images. Right? It's, ex it's an extraordinary amount of work, and, and it's not su it's not successful in kind of universally applying to any any EM data set. Um, there's a there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done, but it's uh, it's a very active area in each subdomain. I I completely agree with that concern, and that's a big part of what what we're working on. Um, I think one of the challenges is that thus far 
there has been a, a huge amount of work sort of roughly in that direction, but not nearly enough that sort of tries to consolidate it. Um, and a lot of this has to do with, I think, actually, ultimately, the sort of incentive structure. Um, you know, contributing some really useful code to a project on GitHub is actually not valued as much as, for example, submitting a conference paper to a nice, you know, public that gets you a nice little publication, and then you put a little bit of code online and nobody uses it, and no one ever uses the technique that you made that might really be cool. Um, so at least on in terms of actually analyzing imaging data um, and a variety of neurophysiological data, the tools we're trying to develop are basically for the purpose of bringing together lots of methods and really emphasizing not I don't I don't know how to solve a lot of these problems. I don't think any of us independently know how to solve these problems. But if we build sort of infrastructure and platforms and ways to kind of combine and vet and compare all the different ways of solving these problems and bring it all together and actually get credit for you know putting stuff on GitHub, then now we're in a very different regime where we can actually be collectively working on these problems uh, and really making progress. So I think that's what we need to be doing. Jack. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, right. The even worse version is a paper with a little pseudo algorithm in a little box that says this is how this thing will be implemented. And then really nobody uh, nobody uses it. I think one kind of, you talk about where does the money for this kind of thing come from. Um, we've certainly found this in so far as, uh, so we're doing a lot of stuff with a new distributed computing platform called Spark, which is for a whole bunch of reasons incredibly popular now in industry and has seen a huge uptake in a lot of industry applications. And as a result, some of the stuff we've been doing, which is basically using Spark for the purpose of analyzing images and time series, which is not really what it was made for, but it turns out to be a, a sort of cool use case, uh, has made a lot of people from sort of industry interested in uh, either contributing to code that we're working on or even you know, helping us develop that stuff. And their money is coming from very different places. It's not coming from the NSF and NIH. It's coming from the fact that people are paying tons of money to build uh, really cool algorithms for doing uh, really, I would say, kind of uninteresting things like ad recommendation. Um, but there's a huge amount of money in it. And I think this is, you know, again, via these collaborative things like GitHub, this is a way to start taking some of that you know, huge amount of talent and maybe trying to bring some of it back by basically working on technologies that are relevant to both communities. I would like to disagree. Great. <laughs> uh, not actually with Jeremy, sorry, but with Jack. Uh, <laughs> Great, even sorry. better. <laughs> sorry, Jack. Um, so we put all of our code open source, and I find that, so I have some code for doing calcium deconvolution, and people use it, and they want user support, and it's about maybe five minutes a week uh, for me, because mostly people will email me, hey, this doesn't work, and I, there's something trivial, or um, I run it for them, or whatever. And it turns out that I get a lot of citations on that paper, and that matters to me for like professional development. And I'm pretty sure they're citing me because they're using my code in their analyses because it's useful, because I've responded to their email. And it's not the best code. It doesn't work better than other things. There's plenty of other things that work just as well. But I responded to their email. It took five minutes, and now I have more citations. So there, there is a built-in incentive structure. We just, I think, forget that that counts and matters. So. Um, but I think there's another scenario. I wasn't disagreeing with you. No, I know, but I'm just, I'm just defending Jack. Um, uh, I, I think that's totally true, but imagine a slightly different scenario where, let's say there is an existing repository that does some kind of analysis and you're a grad student and you want to add a cool chunk to it that's gonna let it do something new. Um, I think that's a very interesting case because that is a case where you will not necessarily want to go write a paper about it. It might not even warrant, in the way we think about stuff now, warrant an entire paper. You know, you're not going to yeah, have a conference proceeding about some nice cool chunk that you've added to a, to a repo. But that's a really valuable contribution, and we should be doing everything we can to, you know, actually the way the incentive structures work now, that student might be more encouraged to build their own thing, which is different enough to warrant a publication, but actually kind of useless to the community. 
And I think we, we need to think about ways, and maybe this will just happen as we sort of dissolve the publication system, which I'm all in favor of. Um, <laughs> seriously, but uh, I, I think that is what we need to be, that is the concern. So, so we're sort of running out of time. So uh, no, Terry, yes, yeah. and then maybe the last question. Yeah, well, back, actually, yeah. I'm eating to my own time here. <laughs> uh, Thank you. But uh, no, I, uh, Vince Cerf wrote a, a little essay in Science, this is about a year ago, on a crisis in computer science having to do with the business model of how you maintain data. Who, who pays for you know, the, the servers and who, who's also, you know, for all of the data that everybody is creating and using. And uh, you know, they, they offered some ideas, but basically it's an unsolved problem. And, uh, and I, I was wondering, I just, just want to get some numbers. How much does NIH spend on maintaining its databases, which is a small fraction of probably what the rest of the world is paying, right? I don't think I have that number. I think it's a big number. And I think NIH, you know, one of the problems at NIH is that it's the National Institutes of Health, so it's 27 quasi-independent organizations that would count a database as a different thing. But, I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's got to be a big number in the, on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars. And it's growing. Yes. It's growing very quickly. And uh, unless we plan ahead, it is growing exponentially in fact, unless we plan ahead to s sort of think about triage, maybe not all databases are created equal, maybe you know, we have to figure out you know, which ones are being used the most and which code is being used the most, you know, the, it, uh, we're not, it's not sustainable. So there are models for this in other communities on a much smaller scale, the speech community has been issuing corpora and toolkits for decades, and they're supported by government agencies to do that. They release them and become known in the community for, for the data. On a much larger scale uh, is, a, is ongoing work in, uh, in the climate change community, and actually where huge numbers of uh, uh, very large databases from multi ensembles of global climate simulations and these are done every six years as part of the evaluation, ongoing evaluation of climate change. Uh, and those, there's very large repositories and toolkits for uh, accessing those data. So there are examples in other communities that we can go to. Very good. Thank you very much for panel and great discussion.